Hello, and welcome to the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement's podcast, Wonks at Work. I'm Craig Wilson, your host, a self-declared wonk, dad of two boys, native Arkansan, and I've been the health policy director at the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement for more than a decade. On this show, we aim to demystify, boil down, and unwonk, if you will, complex topics so that you can understand how the healthcare system is working or not working for you. Our 28th episode, I'm not going to delve into statistics or describe a health policy problem in elaborate detail like I sometimes have a tendency to do on this show. Why? Because I'm absolutely positive that I have two, that's right, two experts who can do it far better than I can. What I will offer as a reminder before I introduce these two fine folks is that I'm the proud father of two boys, eight and five, whose births were fairly harrowing. Um, With my oldest, what was supposed to be a scheduled labor induction turned into an emergency C-section after the umbilical cord got wrapped around his neck and the nurses temporarily could not find a heartbeat. And my youngest, well, He just decided he wanted to crash the life party about a month early. Now, despite their wild entrances into the world, they turned out as very healthy boys. And a clear sign of that is that they both have turned into dedicated St. Louis Cardinals fans, which I am proud of. But my point of relaying all of this is that while, yes, there was some luck and divine intervention for uncontrollable variables, My wife and I had some of the best expert advice, access to care both preterm and postpartum, and support from family and friends that anyone can have. Plus, because of the work that I do, I was familiar with how to navigate the system. Unfortunately, some, if not most, folks who are starting a family don't walk into it very well equipped. So here with us today to talk about what we can do to better equip those who want to start a family is first my colleague and friend, Dr. Cashel Nash, who is the Medical Director for Health Equity and Public Programs at Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield. And most recently, she has been on the speaking circuit. And yes, I fact-checked that presentation for the National Institute of Healthcare Management, and I was watching too. She's also been getting the word out for the Vaccinate the Natural State campaign. But I really know her from our very frank side conversations at stakeholder meetings as Arkansas implemented the Affordable Care Act about a decade ago. Also, I'm very excited to have with us Dr. Neil Shaw, who's a national leader in maternal health and the chief medical officer for MAVEN, a virtual clinic for women's and family health. Dr. Shaw was the founding director of the Delivery Decisions Initiative at Ariadne Labs a joint venture for health systems innovation at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And he's also the founder of Costs of Care, which is a non-governmental organization dedicated to providing better health care at lower cost, and co-founder of the March for Moms Association, a coalition advocating for the health and well-being of mothers, who we all love, right? Welcome both of you to the show and hold on to all the hats you wear because we're about to have a wonky good time. Thanks for joining me. All right. So before we get to the more serious stuff, I want to know what keeps you busy when you're not being Dr. Nash and Dr. Shaw. <laughs> That's a good question, especially since Craig, you dated me. Seriously. Okay. <laughs> That's that. okay. That's okay. Um I like to cardio box, believe it or not. Cardio box. Cardio boxing, yeah. And I DIY anything at home, but usually that means mess it up. But I got a (laughs) spray gun. That's my newest thing, a spray gun. So I'm going to spray everything. So would you you call yourself handy? No. I mess it up. Yeah, you kind of go go in blind and watch the YouTube about it. And then then you call somebody to, to really fix it. That's it. <laughs> Dr. Shaw, what about you? Um, I, well, I was relating to uh, your, your stories in many ways. My, my uh, first son also came, like surprised us and came a yeah. month early. Um, and, uh, you know, the second one was wonky too, but I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old. So I spent a lot of time yeah. chasing them, honestly. 
Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Dr. Nash, I, I can relate. I mean, I, as a surgeon, I am good at putting things back together, rest assured. But I think <laughs> for the DIY, DIY category, I'm much better at taking things apart and uh, usually a couple of extra parts in the end. But <laughs> good, good. All right. So, um, so this is my, my question that I ask of all my guests because it, it, I think it tells me a lot about you. Um, and so I want to know, what would you say is your theme song? Now, now for me, I, I, I can't have one theme song, so I have like a soundtrack of my life, right? But what's your, what would you say is your theme song? Um, for me, right now, it is really this song by Andrew Day, uh, uh. Rise Up. Um, because it has these themes of gospel that I grew up with in my house, uh -huh. but also it's been my life of persistence, right? So Craig knows whether I'm talking about clinical practice, public health, teaching, or whatever, it's all been about health equity. And, yeah. You know, you can knock me down and I keep getting back up. I just keep <laughs> coming back. <laughs> and now I'm back in the health plan space. <laughs> like we said, Andrew Day. She's yep. a good one. Dr. Shaw, what about you? Oh, man. Um... I feel like it's it's very context dependent. It's hard to pick a theme song. It's more like a soundtrack. I know. Yeah. I think I'm going to go more genre than okay. song. I think I I go for like something like '80s and new wave because it's there like you go. Got that like you know comforting familiarity, <laughs> uh, but it's got you know a good beat. We're sort of like driving forward, you know, yeah, something like that. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> okay, so um, Dr. Nash, uh, could you tell us about your role at Blue Cross and why the creation of this new role was important for Blue Cross and important for you? Um, so I've been at Blue Cross for nine years now, wow. and I've had, I've had multiple roles. I know it's been a while. I've had <laughs> multiple roles, um, but most recently my title has changed to Medical Director for Health Equity and Public Programs. And really that comes at a recognition of a number of things in the health plan space. One is that equity has to be a part of quality. And, you know, and that was really exemplified in, in COVID. Uh, again, we all, all of us policy folks have been talking about this for, you know, double digit years, uh, yeah. at least, if not more. Um, and so it's a recognition of equity as a part of quality. It's a recognition that this has a great impact on cost of healthcare. Also, mm -hmm. we must address these issues, you know, and I think also, it, as I was saying, I'm persistent and it allows me to work in my passion. And as the largest health insurer in the state, that, that is a stakeholder that has a great role to play, I believe. Yeah. And so we're, a part of my role is to figure out what that role is. A long time coming. Glad it's yeah. here. So I, I want to get to the partnership. Uh, with MAVEN as a potential solution to poor maternal and infant uh, health outcomes. But Dr. Nash, tell us about the extent of what we are dealing with in Arkansas, because it's a huge issue. Right? You know, it, it definitely is a huge issue. And, you know, we've come through the month of April and the first, I guess, the second recognition of Black Maternal Health Month and then Minority mm -hmm. Health Month. Um, and that represents to me a renewed focus on data and health inequities. And I don't want to just trot out all the, all the bad statistics. Um, I used to do that early in my career. So I'm very excited to be here with you and talking about solutions, but to put yeah. it in context, you know, the United States as a whole has a rising maternal mortality rate higher than most um, and, um, high income countries. And then when we look inside of Arkansas, Arkansas is at the bottom of the pack and then women of color inside the state of Arkansas are even more challenged. One of our colleagues um, at the health department, Dr. Gr um, William Greenfield, uh, looked at maternal mortality and found that black women were over two times more likely to die in pregnancy. Mm. And that is a small count compared to all the people that have serious maternal mortality. And Dr. Shaw is expert in this area um, so I will say, I will defer to him with more specifics, but our, as we know, Arkansas um, has its issues and unfortunately the March of Dimes has given our state a yeah. Mm. Ouch. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you one other personal context for me. I was one of those premature babies real, a long time ago yeah. when I was born. So this is really a passion issue for me also. Okay. 
So, Dr. Shah, Maven has entered into Arkansas. I want you to tell us what Maven is all about, but also your career seems like it would allow for considerable choice in what you pursue. So why Maven and why now? Hmm, that's a great question. I mean, um, midlife crisis. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I was a professor for like a better part of a decade before I came to Maven. And so, you know, I was chasing down those statistics yeah. and trying to explain them to people. And, um, you know, had a point of view on solutions, but I was just tired of evangelizing them without actually building them, to be totally honest. Yeah. I think the other thing too is I spent a lot of time working in what we now call the brick and mortar healthcare system, because Maven is a digital health solution. Yeah. And, you know, delivered babies myself. My last baby I delivered was in July, but I delivered thousands of babies. And um, just that's really the last mile, right? That moment, that harrowing moment that you described. Yeah. Um, there's only so much you can get done in a 15 minute punctuated visit, which is mm -hmm. in the office. And then, you know, health happens in people's like communities, in their houses. And uh, I still see patients every Wednesday, but I, I think, you know, what can I get done in 15 minutes? And what could I get done for somebody if I lived in their pocket? You know, yeah. you know if I could access, if, access uh, if they could access care through their device. Um, and that was just really compelling. So been at Maven for nine months as a chief medical officer in a startup that makes you a veteran. And, uh, <laughs> you know, actually to be very, very honest with you, a big part of what compelled me to come to Maven was the opportunity to work with Dr. Nash. It was the opportunity to come to Arkansas to really think specifically about the exchange population that both of you, yeah. were, um, uh, I understand are a key part of enabling and the Medicaid population in particular. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a, a question for either or both of you. So how did the partnership between Maven and Blue Cross come together in Arkansas? And what are the outcomes that you expect for patients and families from, from the partnership? You know, Craig, that's a, that's a very good question. And in a nutshell, I will say that, that the stars have been aligning. So I think, I think this is a, a perfect partnership. And I just want to thank Dr. Shaw um, for being here and partnering with us. He is, his passion is, is, is palpable, even, you know, virtually, as you yeah. can see. Um, but it, at, in Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield, as medical director for the exchange, we were looking at our data and looking internally about how we reach our members, right? Do we reach them with our traditional uh, uh, maternity programs, which, you know, from a commercial point of view and from a health plan point of view is pick up a phone, try to engage the member, that type of thing. Well, we knew that that was not necessarily effective in our population for the exchange specifically. And then we want to reach more women and high risk women. Mm -hmm. So um, Maven uh, came on the scene and we've been actually in discussions and working with each other for over a year, a year and a half now. Um, in this process. And so when I think about what our outcomes are, and uh, Dr. Shaw will explain in more detail um, um, the solution in, in itself, but it's increased engagement mm -hmm. with high-risk mothers um, earlier, right? And that, that would translate into increased quality and better outcomes ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what we want to see. Yeah. So, so how does, how does then the platform achieve that? How do they access it and what kind of services are available? Dr. Shaw? Yeah, sure. So for, um, you know, the, the members uh, of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arkansas that uh, Dr. Nash alluded to, um, it, essentially there's no out-of-pocket cost for, mm. for using Maven. Uh, it turns out like the average person apparently spends like seven or eight hours a day uh, of screen time. Um, and it's like, honestly, it's not normative outside of San Francisco yet for people to use their phones to manage their health. Yeah. Right. Right. I think it will be, but I think it will be in Arkansas in the next year or two. Huh. Uh, and I think that'll be game changing because we know, you know, there's all this buzz about digital health. And uh, I think it's important to be like clear about like what it is and what it isn't, you know, like you can't deliver a baby through a screen yeah. uh, as far as I know. You know, <laughs> uh, right, right. But, but there's so many other things that you can do. Um, 
And, and the power of digital health is that you sort of remove physical proximity as a constraint to what you have access to. So like a great example of like, you know, the, the person that uh, Dr. Nash and I are, are, are like particularly concerned about is uh, that sort of high risk person that she alluded to is mm-hmm. uh, someone who might have um, high blood pressure or diabetes during pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy is like the body's first stress test. And so you unmask a lot of chronic conditions. You find a lot of things like diabetes. If you have diabetes, usually what you have access to is an obstetrician like me. We're like surgeons. We're not the most helpful person. (laughs) If you have diabetes, like the most important thing to do is to change your diet, but like radically changing your diet is really hard. You need is like help, coaching, motivation, and you need a nutritionist and anyone who can like be there for you on demand. This was actually one of the most compelling things that brought me to Maven is that, uh, you know, I'm not a product developer. I don't know how to do this. Like the folks at Maven, our product team already figured out how to do this, but theoretically anywhere you are in Arkansas, 24 seven on demand, you can get access to a human being in 30 minutes. And uh, if you're Mm. trying to plan a meal, if you're at the grocery store or you're trying to, you're like looking at your fridge, trying to plan a meal, like that's when you need to get to somebody to help them change their diet. Yeah. Not a rescheduled appointment like three weeks later. And I think that's a game changer. That's big. That's big. So um, Dr. Shah, I, I was reading a, a Q&A with you and, and you had this quote, which I, I, I really like. And it was, if moms are unwell, society is unwell. And what did, what did you mean by that? And that's really been the animating impulse for my career. You know, I'll tell you like as a, a man in my mid twenties, which was a while ago, that's when I chose to be an obstetrician. And it was like the last thing I ever thought I was going to do. But <laughs> what I found, uh, one, I mean, like, I think if you're, you know, in the business of helping people deliver their babies, like it's pretty compelling, right? Yeah. Uh, there's no existential crisis in the middle of the night if you're helping deliver a baby. <laughs> so that, that, that helped. But it was also like the, what I, what I saw in taking care of people who are trying to start and grow their families is that, yeah, like maternal health is sort of a bellwether for everything in society, every injustice in our society shows up mm-hmm. in the well-being of moms, whether it is racial inequity, gender inequity, geographic inequity, which is particularly important when we think about why Arkansas is 47 out of 50 in maternal yeah. mortality. Um, mm-hmm. And the kinds of people that uh, wanna serve those kinds of families were the kinds of people I wanted to be more like. But uh, yeah, that that is just something that I've found to be true over and over again in my career. Get that beginning of life right. <laughs> for moms. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, the thing is, um, there, there's something about the fact that we're all born that interestingly makes us less empathetic. Like when people have cancer, you can like push a button and like a thousand pink ribbons will show up. Yeah. Like, you know, moms are like, it's for whatever reason, moms are expected to put them, their own well being last to put their families first. This is a broad expectation of moms. So you see like moms against drunk driving, you see like moms against guns, and you rarely see moms advocating for their own well-being. Yes. It's so easy to take them for granted. And so um, that was part of what was really compelling to me too. Like that's the opportunity, right? Because if there are these inequities in society or these injustices, moms always end up at the end of the line. Yeah. yeah. We got to put them first. So um, I, I have had, I've had this concern in my in my head as we've gone through COVID and telehealth has been used uh, much more frequently and, and kind of through a spigot really with COVID, but um, it's become more normal uh, and, and more convenient. Um, so for both of you, I, I, I struggle with this question. How, how can we ensure that telehealth doesn't turn into a way of providing more healthcare services and instead becomes integrated into the way that we currently provide services. You know, Greg, I've been thinking about that too. And oftentimes I have more questions than answers. Um, <laughs> as a, I'm a primary care doc by training. So um, I resonate with a lot of the, the, the sentiments that Dr. Shaw has, has stated. And there's some things that you need to be in the room for, you know, uh, yeah. um, but there is a place for telemedicine, definitely. And then when I bring the health equity framework or lens to that, at least what we've seen in rural areas and in our data is that telehealth services are picked up more in 
urban areas rather than rural areas. So that makes me think about what about the infrastructure, not only for, for patients, right? Do they have phones? Do they have access, digital access? Do they have data minutes? But the providers in those areas too, uh -huh. to pivot to um, um, telehealth. So I think to answer your question in that context, I think it's going to be rolling in telehealth services into the larger movement of healthcare from fee for service to outcomes that include patient behavior, patient interaction, patient experience, along with that um, quality. Because if we don't, we're going to get that fee for service churn again and still yeah. not reach the people that we mean to reach in most yeah. need. And I, I agree with all that. And I think, you know, part of what I would add is where I think that telehealth has the most promise are actually in areas where we have historically massively underinvested. So it's like primary care, behavioral mm -hmm. health, yeah. and maternal health. Um, yeah. they're, 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 you know, it, it's not automatically a bad thing to give people more services, um, you know, especially yeah. if they're, they're underserved. Um, we do want to make sure that we're delivering value, though, and we're not adding to healthcare costs and we're not fragmenting the system. And um, so th those things are all top of mind. And in fact, uh, to Dr. Nash's point, a big part of the partnership is a value-based arrangement, right? We, we are committing to uh, improving health outcomes and lowering costs of care as part of our partnership. Good. Good. And then, and, Craig, I think yeah. the other thing that I would add to that is that emphasize the word partnership. This is not taking the place of primary care docs or local docs sure. in Arkansas. This is about supporting and connecting that relationship. So I'm also out on the road talking oh. with and engaging with primary care provider, primary care and OBGYN providers in the state to see this as a tool and how can we support you? Yeah, I know that's a sensitive topic when you're dealing with a, with <laughs> developing a, a network. Oh, you know that. <laughs> Uh, so we touched a little bit on the on the rural aspect in, in that question. So I'm going to jump ahead and and I, I have not um, had the opportunity to watch the full episode, but Dr. Shaw, I did wanted to ask that you you have appeared on on the the Oprah Winfrey and Yance Ford film, uh, The Color of Care. Tell us about the, the film and why it's an important contribution to the health equity conversation. Yeah, sure. So um, early in COVID, like the beginning, um, which is almost hard to remember in some ways, because I, I realized when I was watching the film, I hadn't even processed what it was like in the spring 2020 being on the front lines of delivering healthcare. But yeah, uh, that's when they decided to do this film. Oprah had the foresight. Uh, she heard about a family uh, and a person named Gary Fowler who had been uh, seeking out emergency care with COVID and had been turned away from several hospitals and ultimately died and wondered how many other families this had happened to um, and enlisted Yance Ford, who is a um, Academy Award nominated filmmaker <laughs> um, and uh, to, to uh, depict in real time what was happening in COVID. And we actually filmed uh, in the fall of 2020 so it's kind mm. of extraordinary to like have it come out now and look back in hindsight. Yeah. But um, I'm not surprised that you haven't seen it end to end, Craig, because it's actually hard to watch, which yeah. I understand is like not the way that you um, convince people to watch a film, but its power is that it's unflinching. Yeah. It depicts is that COVID-19 took every inequity in our society and threw it into a pressure cooker to the extent that if you were on the front lines of delivering healthcare, you could see who was most impacted with your eyeballs. It was undeniable that uh, people of color were disproportionately affected. And uh, it makes it very, very hard to spend those two hours listening to the stories of these families and come away and not see racism right. as part of the issue and the way that it's embedded in, in, in our healthcare delivery system. And that's been a very hard thing for people to say um, because when we yeah. say racism, it makes, it, you know, raises hackles because it implies that people are bad and it's not actually that people are bad. What the film shows is that a bad system will beat a good person every time. And I think it really conveys that understanding with a lot of empathy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I yeah, 
my my uh, my only excuse for not making it all the way through the film was it was during a time when I had a lot of time on my hands because it was a couple of weeks ago and I had COVID. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably don't want to be so watching the film. <laughs> I, I, was at, I was at home and had two hours, uh, but uh, but yeah, the, the, the COVID up, no. symptoms got to me a little bit. So yeah. Um, so I haven't had the chance to pick it back up, but I, lo- I do look forward to it. Um, and this might be a question more for, um, for Dr. Nash. Are there policy barriers in Arkansas or, or for you, Dr. Shaw, elsewhere in other states that you might be working in that, uh, if removed, could enhance the potential for success of the MAVEN model or, or even others like it? You know, that, that's a good question because, um, and I like, thank you, Dr. Shaw, for taking us um, to the policy level. I don't think that people really understand the power of embedded, yeah, um, um, structural embedded uh, discrimination or disadvantage that's baked into policies. And so you can have the best intent in the world, but if you keep the same policy, you're going to have the same outcome. Mm-hmm. So when we look at policies overall, I have lots of questions about policies to enable telemedicine. I mean, especially coming from a health plan space now, I've learned so much about, you know, credentialing, right? How do you, how how do you take advantage of this type of partnership or a provider um, across state lines when state rules and regs are different for providers Mm -hmm. in every different state? Um, Broadband access, as we know, is a major problem in many areas in uh, for the women that we're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are two off the top of my head. And then, of course, reimbursement, right? How do you get paid um, as a provider? And what does that mean for local providers? Um, so I, I think medical legal issues will come also, questions. Because um, what happens when something goes wrong? You can't, you can't catch everything telemedicine. So what happens? I think there, there, as I stated, I have more questions than answers. Dr. Shaw, from your perspective uh, in this, what do you, what do you see? There's something that you said at the beginning, Dr. Nash, that like uh, reminded me of something my mentor used to say all the time, which is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. So if we're 47th in maternal mortality and there's massive inequity, there's some design in our systems and our structures and our policies And um, I think the two things I would be laser focused on, um, especially with regard to our partnership, is um, increasing access and support through Medicaid. So that's increasing the eligibility um, in terms of the federal poverty limit and making sure we get more people in, um, and then extending Medicaid. One of the cruelest features of the American healthcare system, which is the case in Arkansas as well, is that two months into having a baby, that's like when you're in a nader for anybody who's ever had a baby, right? You're like POW level sleep deprivation. You try to find a living wage because we don't have paid family leave. No. Right. right. Struggling right. existentially. Right. Yeah. And then like, that's the moment where we pull the rug out from underneath you and, and take away your health insurance. That is terrible. And a third of maternal mortality actually happens in that postpartum period. Yeah. So at least give people a year of runway. And a lot of states are starting to do that. Uh, I think there's a big opportunity for Arkansas too. And I'm excited to partner with Dr. Nash to make that happen. Yeah. There will definitely be an opportunity for us at that time to, to link onto that. We were starting to have some discussions around that. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you look at our policy and Craig, you'll have to correct me about this. We have a, we have a gap, right? So if you're on the exchange, you're up to 138% of right. the federal poverty. But the maternity waiver is 200% of the federal poverty level, right? So yeah. what if you turn back and forth? Yeah. And so, yes. So there are some definitely policy um, solutions. And I think extending the postpartum period to a year is definitely one of them that, that we should be advocates for. I'll be, I'll be looking forward to sitting with you and helping fight that fight. Um, so my last question, um, another thing that more generally that I'm concerned about, um, w- we have definitely seen an erosion of trust in science and particularly in public health. And 
I, I'm very worried that if we don't restore that trust, it 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 might spill over into medical care as well. And I, you've probably seen instances of it already. Um, but I'm very concerned about that. It, it, how, how can we restore that trust? And and are you fearful of the same thing? Yes. That's a very good question. Yeah, <laughs> but let me tell you something. Let me. The mistrust has always been there. Sure. In in, in communities of color, number yes. one. To answer the question, how do we get that trust? We become more trustworthy. Okay. We show that we care about the health of all people, and we show them how we do that. Can't you know can't every really day? Better than that, you know. Um, and and I, I really think this is actually the most important frame to put on the opportunity that our healthcare delivery system has. Like it has, you know, yes, there's a lot of misinformation, less trust in science, less trust in public health. But to Dr. Nash's point, like this has been the case in the delivery system for a long time for people who've been historically marginalized and it's not their job to be more trusting, it's our job to be more trustworthy. And I actually think that through our partnership, um, you know, part of that is like being competent at taking care of people and producing equitable outcomes. We've got some work to do there. Part of it is actually just showing up for people though when they need you and when they expect you to and that's what we're able to do through having a digital solution where you know if you need help you can like pick up your phone and like text somebody and they text you back which is not historically how healthcare has worked um, <laughs> I, I think that really matters so that's great well i um this has been a fascinating conversation i really appreciate the both of you joining me uh, on the on the podcast, and um, I, I'm hopeful for what uh, for what Maven and and Blue Cross is is doing in Arkansas uh, with this partnership, and I look forward to improved health outcomes. <laughs> Thanks for for having us, Craig, and um, I, I'm really really grateful to Dr. Nash for her leadership and uh, just the opportunity to partner. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wonks at Work. You can listen to our bi-weekly podcast on our website, achi.net. A special thanks to the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art, which is a part of the Central Arkansas Library System for allowing us to use their studio to record. If you have any topics you would like for us to consider, please email us at achi at achi.net. As a reminder, the views, information, and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are solely those of the guests and do not necessarily represent those of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The podcast does not constitute medical, legal, or other professional advice or services. We hope you've enjoyed our latest episode, and again, thanks for listening.